Hello again, and welcome back to Lost in Translation. My name is Nico. This week, we're taking a look at the portion Todot, and we're going to go over the 10 things you're going to miss when you only read the portion in English. So right off the bat, number one. Todot, there's that word again right generations offspring here we go um and these are the generations okay so we know right away that what we're gonna get is more information about this general situation that we were told up here at the beginning or at the end of last week's parashat, Kaisra. Right? So, Todot is coming to tell us more information about that. Okay, very interesting. Sometimes in the Torah, we get some misspellings or abstracts or, you know, uncommon spellings, right? So, let's take a look at number two. Okay, there are two nations, two nations growing in your belly, right? And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. By Hashem la shani goyim. Here it is spelled correctly for us to read it, but in fact, in the Torah, it's spelled with two yuds. Not to be confused with two youths or the twins that were in her belly. So there she's got twins, and it's spelled in the with this uncommon way with two youths, you know. And the yud, the yud itself looks a bit like an embryo, so maybe that's what it's going on about, or maybe it's talking about yud being the number 10, that there are these two systems of 10, these two complete. You've got the pure side and the impure side that are being separated uh, within her womb. Number three. Number three is interesting. Jacob's name. Okay, we find out why they're getting each other's names, why they're getting their names. Esav is uh he he comes out uh, all hairy and uh he's named Esav because uh the Ein and Sheen are similar to this Sheen and Ein that the She'ar that he's hairy, right? And down below then comes Yaakov, Yaakov Avinu, right? He his hand was grasping Esav's heel, Be'akiv. Yetza achiv yado ochedzet Be'akiv Esav, right? Vayikra shemo Yaakov. So the name, the, the, the letters for heel, are exactly the same as the last three letters of his name. It becomes interesting that it also is, this, these are the same three letters for the word ekev, which uh, we see a little bit later in the portion. When, uh, when Hashem is, is promising to, to uh, Yitzhak that he's going to take care of him, that, uh, you know, because because of the promise that he made to his father, Abraham, who kept his ordinances, his, his commandments, and his Torahs, right? Right, so it's, it's right here in verse 5 of the next chapter, Ekev asher shma'a Abraham mekoli ve shomor mishmarti mitzotai uh, 
Torotai, Torotai. Um, and so right here, we're getting this connection between Yaakov and Avraham, something that's not existing between Esau and Avraham. Okay. So we see how Yaakov is connected to Avraham in this poetic way. And we can also see how Esau gets connected back to Adam. Right? So let's take a look here. Okay, so we already know, we learn in this story that, uh, that Esau is a man of the field. He's outside. He's, uh, he's in nature. He knows animals. He knows game. You know, the same way that Adam knew the animals, he could name them, right? Uh, so he came in from the field and he wanted something to eat. Pour into me some of this red, red pot, like this very red stuff, right? And right here, Vayomer Sab El Yaakov, Kil Ilteni Na Min Haadam Haadam. Right? Adama, Adam, Edom, right? This is why eventually, Haze uh, Ki. Uh, okay, because I am tired and Alken uh, Edom. So he becomes the father of the nation of Edom. And this is connected, these are the same letters for, Ad, for Adam almost, right? We have this, this uh, inclusion of the Vav. But, so there's this connection back to Adam and probably this connection back to the, the curse of Adam because. Through, uh, through this episode, at the end, when he gives up his birthright to be connected to Abraham, which he isn't, because Yaakov and Ekev, he is connected to Abraham. What happens is that, that uh, Jacob gives him bread, and bread is the one thing that, uh, that is mentioned to Adam, that he's going to have to make bread, uh, take bread from the ground through the sweat of his brow. Right? So there's this conceptual connection back to Adam. And right now we see in this way that the two brothers are completely separated. They're on two completely different spiritual paths, right? And so maybe this is how the two systems of 10 are being separated in Rivka, in Rebecca, the mother. Okay, number five. There is a new incidence of, of a famine of Yitzhak going to the south, but he doesn't go to Egypt. He's commanded to stay in the land of the Philistines, where he makes and where he, he redigs the wells that his father had dug, and he makes a new uh, covenant, a new pact with the king Abimelech. And you know, it seems like a repetition of almost exactly of what happened uh, to to Avraham when he when he stayed in uh, Abimelech's kingdom. But also, you have this enrichment that uh, they they kick him out the same way Egypt kicked out uh, Avraham. Abimelech eventually kicks out uh, kicks out uh, Yitzhak and. The, the, the covenant comes later. So it's a very interesting corollary that, that Yitzhak lowers his spiritual level, but not to the degree of, of Mitzrayim, of being in limitation, never leaves the land of Israel. And eventually he rises back up again to Beersheba, the same place where his father uh, used to, to dwell. Number six, Yitzhak is jesting with Rivka. So, okay, during this time that he goes down to the kingdom of Abimelech, you know, it's the same thing. He's worried that he's going to get killed because his wife is beautiful or she's, she's fair to look upon. And, uh, 
and uh, yeah, he they lie about their relationship that he's that she, she they say that she is his sister. And Abimelech finds out and gets upset and says, "Why did you do this? One of my one of my people almost uh, almost uh, took your wife because they they didn't know that they were that you were married." And it becomes clear that they that they were married. It become because Itzhak was jesting with Rivka, and this again is this very same word mitzachek. Yitzchak metzachek, right? So I mean, he's being himself with her. He's, he's it's this is the verb uh, for the quality uh, for the quality of Yitzchak. Uh, we we so it gets translated in many ways to jesting or ridicule, like Ishmael metzachek, uh, and 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 Sarah gets upset and throws him out because he doesn't want. Uh, him to connect to the quality of Yitzhak, right? So here again, we see this, this word that gets translated in many different ways, but in Hebrew, it is an obvious connection back to the name of our father, Yitzhak. And uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, number seven, Esav's wife. Okay, so Esau was 40 years old. This number comes up a lot. The 40 days in the, uh, in the you know, the 40 days of the flood, uh, you know, 40 years in the desert. Yitzhak is 40 years old when he, when he marries uh, Rivka. And here we have Esau, 40 years old, when he takes... Uh, two wives, both of them are daughters of Canaan. Exactly the thing that that's not supposed to happen, that we don't want to connect to the curse of, of, of Ham, that we don't want to connect to the curse of the, uh, of the Canaanites, but that's exactly what Esau is doing because he's the quality of Adam and he is in the curse. That's it. He has no other choice, right? And uh, that's, yeah. That's the way it is, and we see here that it that there that they are a cause of they were a vexation to the of the spirit, or they were a source of spiritual rebellion. This ruach means spirit, ruach ruachni is spirituality. Um, so that they were a, they were a problem for the spirituality of of uh, Yitzhak and uh, and Rivka further separating this son from the, uh, from the quality of the patriarchs. Okay, number eight, stealing a blessing? Okay, so first of all, we know that there's this long story of, of uh, blind Yitzhak asking, Esau to go and bring him game and that he can make a blessing and Rivka intervenes and tells Yaakov to get the goats and she makes the meal for him and and in the end in the end Yaakov uh, tricks his father and gets the blessing instead and this leaves this leaves Esau so upset he's crying and begging his father for a blessing and eventually he's so upset that really he wants to he's waiting for his father to die so that he can kill Yaakov. Because he doesn't want to kill Yaakov while his father's still alive. But, man, it's just a blessing, right? I mean, if my father wanted to say some nice words to my brother and not to me, I mean, I'm not going to want to kill my brother over it. So obviously there's something much deeper, something more important here, right? That this, by by... By receiving the blessing from Yitzha, uh, from from his father Yitzchak, this is Esau's last chance to be connected to the heritage of uh, of his grandfather Abraham. And once once uh, once this is broken, once once Yaakov comes in and takes the blessing too, the the severing is complete. Uh, he has he has. Uh, 
He has nothing else to do. Number nine. Jacob, Yaakov Avinu, our father Jacob, he is sent to Padan Aram to, to, to take a wife, right? So here, you come to the end of this incident with the, the stealing of the blessing and, and, the Esau, and Rebecca or Rivka, she understands that Esau wants to kill her other son, Yaakov, and she's coming up with this idea to, to get her son out of town. Um, and she wants him to go back to her, her, her father's house, to Leban, and, uh, and she uses the excuse of the Canaanite women, right? Let's send our son back. And Rebecca said to Yitzhak, I'm disgusted with, the life, with my life because of the daughters of Chet, right? These, uh, these daughters that are, that are married to Esau, right? And, you know, this chet, uh, it reminds us, uh, it reminds me of the, of the Hebrew word for sin, right? Uh, I mean, he's, he's attached to this, to this, to being separated. He's separated to, from, uh, from Hashem. Esau is separated from Hashem this way. And this, for Rivka, who wanted to be connected to Hashem, who left her family to be connected to, to Hashem, she's not lying. And it really troubles her. And she uses this as a way to convince uh, Yitzchak that they should send their son away to, to find a, uh, a wife from her house, from their house, back in their, in their land of origin. Okay, and the last one, number 10. It's interesting here, the, the curse and the connections get even more compounded. Number 10... Here we go. Esau saw that Yitzhak had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padam Aram. Right? And also in particular that you shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And yeah, so Yaakov went away. And Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan were displeasing to his father. And we know that he loves his father. Right? We know that he wants to make his father proud. And so his solution here is not to also go to Padan Aram and find a, find a wife and disassociate with the, uh, with the daughters of Chet. Instead, what he does is he takes a third wife. He keeps the first two and he takes another. And this third wife is uh, the daughter of Ishmael, his uncle. Right? Okay, I know. I think cousins are, but no. If we remember that Ishmael is a son of an Egyptian woman, his wife is an Egyptian woman, he lives near the border of Egypt. So by taking, uh, by taking Nabaioth as, uh, as his wife, Esau not only connects himself to the curse of the land of Canaan, but now he connects himself firmly back to Mitzrayim, to the limitation, and uh, the, the separation is complete. The two regimes are apart, and they are so opposite that, of one another that only one will rule, right? When one is ruling, the other is weak, when, and, and that's what we see. Even today, uh, you know, we, we, I think the, the, yeah, the uh, uh, old saying that when Jerusalem is wealthy, uh, Caesarea will be will be in poverty, and vice versa. This is this connection back to this idea. This there's an old tradition that Rome, uh, that the the Romans are descendants from uh, from Edom, from the nation of Esau, right? And that's why there was this animosity. If it's not doesn't have to be true, but symbolically, I mean, if you see the, how, di how different the cultures were, it might as well be true, right? So I hope that you found this interesting and helpful. You know, share with me your ideas, like, uh, comment, subscribe, 
and let me know what you're thinking about this too. We will see you next week uh, with the next uh, Torah portion. Until then, 